to, to get started to spend plenty of time here, right? Uh, I know that all of you are busy with your courses. Mm, I've tried my best to give you interesting things to do. Uh, I still recommend that the best thing you can do is take the notebooks, you know, clone them, delete all the code that's in them and just rewrite it a couple of times repetitively. After that, most of it uh, will be easier. For those who have not spent time, this course is going to go by very quickly. We have only a couple more sessions left and then your project. So please try to put an extra burst, maybe this coming weekend or something like this. I'm always here to help you. So if there's anything, some of you have reached out to me asking for help. Uh, I hope uh, I have, I think I have been very responsive, but uh, please try it out. Reach out to me if you need any help and we'll see what we can do. Okay, have you completed lab one? Uh, I wrote it and I completed it. Let's see. Uh, okay, many of you have done it, so that's wonderful. And in the course, of, in the context of working with on lab one, just a few of you haven't. So please, uh, you know, the goal of the lab is not for me. At least, it's not about grades. It is about practice time, quality practice, focus practice time. So please sit down and do it. If you get stuck, you know, reach out to me or one of your friends. Uh, but make sure you don't lose the opportunity of learning it. Okay. You, sometimes you can copy paste an answer and miss something. Some of you have also sent me emails asking for better ways to do something. So that's also a nice way to uh, be more effective in your code. Okay. So have fun with it. And uh, I hope it's not like some of your other assignments as just tedious. I try not to make anything tedious. Most of the answers should be easy for you to get. Okay. What about lab two? Um, okay, many of you haven't done lab two. Actually, that may not be so much of a problem because <coughs> lab two is all about pandas. And today we will do pandas section two and there are a couple of questions from today's session. So I think it's okay if you haven't done lab two, but please this weekend and by the time the next class gets here, if you can get lab two done, uh, it shouldn't be very hard after today's session anyway. Okay, uh, and about pandas, uh, let's see how, I think it's useful, I need more practice. Okay, so for the few who are comfortable, that's wonderful. Now you should start expanding and using it aggressively. I have found myself that when I thought I was comfortable, when I started writing a lot of code using pandas, I found that there was always something new I could learn there, okay? And for those who need more practice, yes, you have a lab and projects and things coming up. So I think we should be good here. Uh, so the next and most important thing for today is of course to write some code. So again, uh, we can use this notebook for the live session. So if you want to go there um, and get set up, give me a second as well to get set up. Sorry, I need two minutes just to start everything here. Uh, while I'm starting stuff, are there any questions for me at this moment? Uh, how many of you, can you, some of you let me know in chat, are you logged in and uh, running? <clears throat> uh, maybe one or two volunteers can let me know if you're logged in and running your notebooks. Anyone? The notebook we want to use is a notebook which we used last time. 
uh, it's called introduction to pandas uh, on chat can you let me know if you're able to run the notebook and also can you see my notebook now Uh, yes to yes to both. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so you have the notebook running. So uh, I will start writing some pandas code today. If anyone needs any review or recap, just let me know. <coughs> but where I will start, I guess, is the simplest thing, right? The workhorse activity for us today is to use these pandas data frames, and we will use these panda data pandas data frames to manipulate data. Okay. So last time I told you that. Uh, there are some patterns to create a data frame, you know, to use the indexes, etc. Today, if you scroll down, let's see if we can get to the section I want to spend time on today. Okay, so there is this section here called combining data frames, merge and join. Do you all see it? Or uh, somebody, can you let me know if you can be at this section? But then we can start for earnest. One more response from you and then I can go. Uh, so yes, uh, are you able to find this section? Okay, good. So let's get started. So what am I going to do today? So there's a lot of uh, uh, pandas um, commands, but I think the best way to learn pandas commands is not just to try to memorize all the commands, but try to do something useful or interesting. And then we can, uh, you know, we can learn as we go. After this class, I will send you an email with a couple of resources that you can use. The pandas documentation is still the best resource out there, but I'll send you a couple of resources. Use these notebooks again. Like I said, you can delete all this code and just write it yourself. And if you write it better, then if you have a better way, uh, but do send it to me. Okay, so to start off, remember the old student grades database that we created. And some of you who worked on the labs would be familiar with this database. I thought that this database is a reasonably interesting or complicated data structure. It has about five or six ta five tables, right? So there's some interesting joints that you can do. So today we'll use the same data structure and try to manipulate it with pandas, right? And uh, show you that just as we can manipulate data in the database using SQL, now we will do the same thing in pandas and we'll, we have to spend some time. You have to spend some time thinking about <clears throat> what lives in the database and what lives in pandas. Okay. Uh, but, uh, okay. So we, if you have a question about this, ask me later and we'll get, let's get to writing code now. So the important thing here is I wrote this small little function. <clears throat> it's kind of useful function. It goes and gets all of the data, but it actually, uh, instead of returning, uh, some other data structure right now, it returns us a data frame. So if we run this, we should see that we've got a table back, but this time it's a pandas data frame, right? So the main point here is that because it's a pandas data frame, we can actually run pandas queries on it. For example, if I wanted to find the student with the data minimum smallest date, youngest student, you could easily run a query like this. And I think this query here symbolizes everything about pandas, right? Which is that uh, with a for loop and with usual Python logic, we could do the same thing. But in order to do the same thing, we'd have to use either a special Python function or we'd have to write a lot of code. And the, the important thing for you to think about and master is that here in one line, we can get interesting behavior. So let's continue down this path and see, you know, and always while you run this pandas queries, you should be thinking, can I write this myself some other way without using pandas? And very soon you'll realize that, yes, you could do it, but it would take time and effort. Okay, so the next thing you can do is you can get another table. So let's get the second table. And the first thing we'd want to do is we'd want to maybe join it, right? And you can inspect just uh, as a recap of pandas behavior, you can inspect properties. For example, you can look at the shape right? Or you can say info, and then it'll tell you some info about the courses. So for example, it says there are five rows, right? And this is the, this is a useful one I found these days because I'm doing some performance optimization on pandas data frames. 
you can keep an eye on the memory usage and so on, right? So simple things. Uh, you can also, if, you, if your data set is interesting, I'll show you maybe later. You can also, there's another command. If you're looking at numerical data sets, you can do describe. But describe is not so interesting on this data set. You'll try to comp compute stats on everything. But it's right now computing stats on ID cores, which is an integer, which is useless. But if you had a data frame with numbers in it, then describe would be interesting as well. So for you right now, if you're just exploring, I think info would be a good thing to do. Okay, so now uh, we can keep on going, right? You can get all the tables like this. I think you should do all of the tables. I'll do, I'll work with these three tables for now, okay? And there's some exercises you can do once you can get all the tables as pandas data frames. The most important workhorse for today, the idea for today is how can we put these data, these tables together? And in SQL, you would use a join. Now in pandas, you have the same functionality, except it's not called join, it's called merge, right? So you can merge two data frames. So let's go over this slowly. Merge takes two data frames. There's the students data frame and the students in courses data frame and then you merge on ID student, right? ID student is the common column. So let me just do, because we're doing it one time. You see ID student is a column. If, if ID student is a column here and ID student is a column here, then just like you would join in SQL on this common column, here you can join on that column, right? And if you did so, you would get a merged table. Right, so if we start to see the SQL functionality re-emerging here, and it's kind of nice that we can manipulate data uh, this way, right? So let's do one more merge. So we'll merge the courses information as well. So let's do that. And now you've got a fairly comprehensive data frame, right? It has all of the data kind of merged in and it's, it's available to you. But now let's see what we can do. So for example, if I wanted to calculate you know, how many students are there in each course? That would be a little tricky to do uh, with simple code, right? You'd have to write filters and then counts and so on. Here, there's a very powerful thing you can do. It's called group by. So you can group this data set by the course name. So that will break, break it up into two groups. And then on each group, you can run any function you want. <coughs> <coughs> so I repeat, group by will gather um, your data set into subsets or split your data set into subsets based on the column values you specify, right? When you say course name, it will split it into two subsets based on the values in course name. I say two subsets because there are only two values in course name. Uh, and then it calls this function size on it. Now, let me just run it like this so that we don't have this extra thing here. Um, uh, so if you just run it like this, uh, okay, so we'll have to call rest again to see it. Okay, so it will look like this, right? So if you actually, uh, the idea was that that, okay, so now we haven't covered this, but we'll hopefully get back to it. This looks like a data frame, but actually it's a series. It's a one dimensional object. Since we are working with data, data frames, uh, you have this method which says two frame. Two frame converts this series back into a data frame and it assigns this uh, label counts to the new column that has been created, right? So you can give it whatever name you want, course counts or whatever, right? Okay, this is a fairly complex operation, right? I don't know if I can find enough words to describe it. So we should just try to write more and more code to use this pattern. Unfortunately, in this course, I cannot stress enough. You could, you could spend a lot of time doing this because this then becomes the core of a much of data analysis in this context, right? You take the data, you split it or group it in certain chunks, and then you apply functions to it, right? I mean, that in a nutshell is everything, right? So that's why this is a little bit complicated in the many, many edge cases. But let's continue. Um, so so I have, uh, this morning I woke up and I was writing some code, so I have some extra code in my notebook. Uh, but uh, anyway, there's nothing here that is very uh, profound. If you need anything, ask me, okay? Uh, I do want to show you this little idea that I was writing a solution for these some of these questions, and I had to write a little Python code. You can always put your Python code in actual Python files, which you can edit with a Python editor. 
And then Jupyter has this cool feature where you can say load, right? And if you say load, it will load the file into your notebook. And then, you know, you can get rid of it and it'll stay in this, uh, in this file. So it's kind, kind of outside your notebook. So now this is a part of the thing. This is just a small exercise for you to do in the lab. So don't worry about my solution. I will tell you what it is. I'm just keeping it hidden for amusement. So and don't get frustrated. If, if you're stuck on it, you should try it and then you should come back. But I'll tell you what is in that solution. The solution basically repeats what I have done here. It merges all of the databases, though, all the data tables, okay, into one data frame. But now I just want to show you, I don't think you need to write this code. I just want to show you what can we do. So here, for example, I've merged all the data. So let's look at this data together. You don't have to write this code now, but you can see that it's a data table. It has, you know, merged data, for example, right? And now let's see what I can do. I can do more things. So for example, I could actually try to ask, you know, what are the grades that a particular student called Jim has in each course, even though there are multiple assignments in the course, right? So you can say data frame, first name is Jim, do a group by the course name, get the scores attribute and ask for the mean, right? And you should see something which looks like this. So notice actually this might be in your labs. So you might, uh, I've already given you major portion of the assignment. The only thing left to do the lab is to do the joins, okay? Which should not be hard, but take your time and do it. If you need help, ask me. But once you have these kind of data frames, you can start to do more and more analysis. So for example, if I want to know what is the average for every student? So I'm going to group by each student first. Then for each student, I'm subsequently going to group by course name and get the mean of the scores. Notice how this is slowly getting more and more powerful. Hopefully it's not getting that much more complicated, but it does require some quiet time and writing code. This is why I'm just intending here, not for you to master it, but for you to see some capabilities, then go home and write some code and then this will become yours. Okay. So if you run it again, you see it has given me a nice report by student and by course name, right? And then for each student, there's an aggregate. So there are multiple assignments. So that has been aggregated for me. Okay. And then you can do different variations of this, right? So you can group by the course name and you can compute the mean and so on. Right. So I won't do all of this because I don't think just doing various group buys is enlightening. Right. I mean, I just want to show you that you can do a lot of it, but now um, one thing here is that this table does has only ID student in it. So this might be interesting has only ID student in it at this moment, it would be nice if I could actually get the student information here. So let us do this. And here I will try to use a new capability of or new. We haven't used it so much, a capability of pandas, which is the fact that you can actually make an index on the table as well. Just like the database has an index on a pandas table, you can make an index. So you take the students table and you call set index on it and set index takes either one column or a list of columns. If you take a list of columns, it becomes something called a hierarchical index. <laughs> and a hierarchical index is a little bit more complicated. So I've been wrestling with this for a while. Either we'll cover it at the end of this session or we'll talk about it in the beginning of the next one. Okay. So for now, use a one column index. It, life is complicated enough as it is with one column indexes. So let's try to, and in databases, most of you might have used one column indexes, but later you can come and look at multi-column indexes. Okay. Ideas are similar, but some details are different. Okay. So once you call the set index method on any, any pandas data frame, then you will get, you know, you'll get a table, which looks like this. And you can see suggestively the display shows this, this column has been lowered a little bit to suggest that it's special. It's also been bolded. So it's the, it's the row index and the student ID is the ID in each row of this data frame, right? So now we want to assign to each student his average score, right? So in this student table, suppose I want to attach, I computed the average score and uh, let's see, here's where I computed the average score. So we grouped by student and we took the score. Notice that this calculation basically creates a student mean. Uh, each student has taken two courses. There are multiple assignments on each course. So we've taken the mean across all the assignments in all the courses, right? So that's this, that's kind of like a comprehensive mean, if you will. So we have the student mean available in this table, right? So we want to now join this table 
with this table. And here is where I wanted to just show you the power of the uh, index. Notice that this structure here has the same index ID student as this index ID student. And so you don't even have to do a join. What I do is I create a new column called average score and then just assign it, right? There's no join or anything needed. Pandas is sophisticated enough to understand that I'm assigning to a new column, a column of values. It's supposed to match everything by the index and do the assignment. Okay. So first time I did this, I was pretty impressed, right? This is where the power of the index comes out correctly. And you see now the average score has been added to the table. Okay, I showed you some very complicated functionality very quickly. I don't know if it would be better if I did it slowly, uh, but uh, <coughs> yeah, if you write this code yourself, I think you should be okay. So let me continue. I'll just show you one more thing and then take a couple of quick questions, okay? So again, we did the joins with the merge before, but now let me just get rid of um, this average score column. So you can just do drop to drop the column. So when you drop the average code, you get back the original table. Now, if I wanted to do a join, so let me try to do a join, but last time I did it by column. Now I will do it by index. I'm going to join using the index. So this table already has an index on students. So we can go and do an index on this table, for example, the students in courses table. And just to make sure that it has, just to make sure that it has an index, let's just look at it. Let me just grab this. It, just to make sure if it has an index, we can just look at the table. Yep, and it has an index on student ID. So now I can merge it just like before. There's no difference here, but instead of specifying the column, and this is the kind of stuff I would tell you even yesterday when I first wrote this code, there was a quick bug for me because you have to normally specify the column name but here, because it's an index, you have to say left index equals to and right index equals to, right? It's a Boolean. It says use the indexes and you can do asymmetric ones as well, where there's an index on the left and a column on the right and so on. So don't get, don't make your life too complicated, but at least here we should learn that we can actually join things if there are indexes by just setting the index equals true and then you get merged tables. Okay. So, so, okay. And then I'll just show you one more thing. If you do all these merges, so this is just tedious stuff, right? You have five tables and you want to merge them. You have to find the right columns and then rinse and repeat, right? Just keep calling merge until you get big large tables. But I want to give you this idea that this is at the core. If you wanted to write summary reports, now that you have this data set, I just wanted to show you, for example, you can select a subset of the table that you've created here. I've taken the column names, a list of column names. I've sorted them by last name. And I can write a report. These are all my students <coughs> or these are all the courses a student has taken, etc. Okay. I said a lot of words. Let me pause quickly. Uh, how does everyone feel with this function? Because I'm going to switch gears now and we're going to pick up a new data set and try to repeat uh, this type of analysis again. So while we are switching context quickly, how, uh, any questions or how does everyone feel about Panda so far? Is there any aspect that is uh, interesting or something? Or oh, is the question too open-ended? I like pandas more than Python. Okay, okay, <laughs> careful on that one. But yes, I think I think all we will go through all these uh, feelings. Okay, you, at one point you're going to love it a lot. Then it's going to break in some strange way. Then you're going to be like, why do I need this thing? But that's all part of the story, right? So. Um, um, just go ahead and, uh, just go ahead and use it. Okay. So now let's switch gears. So go back here, uh, to the, uh, launch page and on the launch page, let's open this, uh, notebook, which is data analysis with Python. So can I have everybody open it once it's open? Maybe we can run the first cell. Yeah. Just run this first cell and then let me know on chat if you've been able to open it and access this first cell. As soon as somebody has a first cell run, the first cell usually takes a little time. The reason why it takes a little time is because this code is running in a virtual machine. And then 
in the virtual machine, the entire info infrastructure has to be initialized. So it's pretty much like running Matplotlib for the first time. And I don't know if you have thought about it, but you can see something like this, which is, you know, it, there's a lot of initialization stuff and it takes some time. So you might get warnings like this, et cetera. But the second time you run it, that warning will be gone and hopefully we can get on our way. Okay, so um, so what are we doing here? Uh, I, I'm still waiting to see if any of you got there. I'm certainly running slow at this moment. Um, but uh, while we're waiting, I might as well just start talking about the problem set. Uh, just finish running, at least someone is there, good. Um, so what is the problem set that we can, ah, mine just finished as well. So what is the problem set here? Uh, honestly, to practice data analysis, whatever the code might be, I think life would be very good if we had interesting uh, data sets to analyze. So far, in some cases, I've used just data sets I've generated by hand. And that's not a bad thing to practice something quickly, just make a data frame with two columns or one index or something, try it out. But in general, it'd be nice to have realistic data sets. And so that's why we took our database and we used it as a data set. But now today I thought, okay, this data set, I will just tell you, I was first introduced to it in the context of uh, some kind of data analysis data set at all. Okay. But this data set has, I don't know why it's been kind of like a meme in uh, data science. I don't know the reason why it became so popular, but anyway, let me tell you what the problem is. And then you can ponder why it became popular. And if you find out, you should let me know. So of course the Titanic was one of the biggest disasters. Oh, was a big disaster. <laughs> and we happen to have an interesting data set. So let me just start by loading the data set so we can look at it together. So if you actually run the second cell, the data set which contains information, right? And actually I think I've put the information here. So let's just look at the information as I've tried to explain it. So this is a data set which contains information on all the passengers on the Titanic. It's a little grim, but people started to ask questions like, can we analyze this data set? And can we see some patterns, maybe some social patterns? For example, could we predict, you know, which person is like, what kind of person is likely to survive? What kind of person is likely to die, etc. Uh, this data set also has some real world symptoms, which is if you look here, so after you load the data set, you can ask, okay, so let's just do some quick explore it. So this part, what we're going to do here, uh, is a synonym, I think, to all of you, how you could do your project, right? If you have some not too well-formed questions, but you have some interesting data set, you would just get the data set in a CSV file. You would pop it somewhere on your, uh, you'd upload it. And then you would just load it up. And the first thing you do is you run something like info. And it tells me I have, for example, 890 odd entries in this CSV file, right? And these 890 entries, notice already you see something strange. Why is one column have a different number? Uh, does anybody want to try to guess why these numbers might be different? It's, it's just a table with equal number of rows. Why would these numbers be different? Anyone want to tell me on chat? I think it's time to guess, not necessarily. You don't have to know it. Can you guess quickly? There are null values, exactly. Good, that's excellent. Thank you for ju pump, uh, jumping in with the answer, yes. So yeah, so let's try to keep some exchange going on chat, okay? So that way at least uh, I'm desperately wanting to know if you are sitting with your cup of coffee and falling asleep or at least engaged, okay? But okay, so let's keep going. So there are null values in this data set. And this was one of the things that I did not enjoy very much, initially at least, because getting data sets which have blanks and nulls makes life very messy for us, right? So, but anyway, we can take it as an opportunity to say, and maybe this is the reason why this data set was considered interesting. Is there a way that we can salvage this data set? So one way to do it is drop all the rows where the value is not, uh, where the value is not available. But if you did that, your data set would become very small. For example, there are many, many places where age is missing. So if you took out all the, all the entries where there is no age in your data set, 
then you, we would have trouble, right? Because it would mean that then we cannot, uh, we cannot do anything with this data set, right? Because it's become very small now. So we'll have to try to find either work around this, don't use that column or try to proxy some values into that column. Okay. And we'll talk about this later. Okay. So we know that this is the data set. We know that it has nulls in it. The next thing we can do is that we can try to go back to the data. And this is very, very important. When you go looking for real world data sets, this is the place where life can get very tricky. We have to understand the domain in which this data set was defined. And that means understanding what are the meanings of all of these columns. Quickly, let me go through a few of them. You can just read this. I don't think it's too hard. Some of them are a little bit tricky. So for example, passenger ID is easy. Survived is the most important one. Notice it's important to know so if, if you have a zero here, it means you did not survive. If you have a one, it means you survived, right? Passenger class. Passenger class is interesting. Initially, I thought, ah, why do I need the passenger class? What am I going to do with it? But actually passenger class is two things, right? One is it actually tells you where the location might be on the ship itself, where you are located first floor or deck or whatever. But it can also tell you that if you're in first class, maybe you're a very wealthy person, your social stature status is reflected in passenger class. And everything that I'm saying now is qual qualitative, right? It's not quantitative. But the qualitative understanding of this data set, if you take time and think about it a lot, then it starts to yield uh, some angles for your data analysis, right? And even though people think that a lot of time is spent writing code, I think that a lot of time should be spent on this meta analysis, right? What is this thing? What is the domain? What are the key ideas here? Uh, can I think about it in a different way or a unique way? Or can I use a column to imply a new meaning, etc.? Okay, so the rest of the columns are kind of uh, self, -descri self, -descri self describing. So you have age. Uh, this is interesting, right? It, it's kind of trying to say if there are groups of people, like if you had siblings and spouses or parents and children. Initially, again, I thought this is not interesting, but later you can say, well, maybe if people were in groups, groups either survived better or survived worse. And these are all questions that you can ask. If there's any information in ticket number, fare, cabin, port of embarkation, so all these fields are available, right? So you have to spend time, you have to look at the data and try to decide if you want to include any of this in your analysis. So what we will do today, we will break the data analysis into two pieces, right? First is kind of exploratory analysis. We try to understand everything. We might be able to come up with some kind of probabilities already, but I think in the next class, uh, so I'm giving you a quick preview in the next class. We will do some actual data analysis, right? We'll take this and we'll build some kind of model. Not, I'm not sure which data set I'm going to use, but we'll build some model and then we can try to predict something. Okay. But I, uh, surely this course cannot give you all of, uh, all of predictive analysis and uh, we'll have to hold that for another class. But if you like this class and you come back, maybe we can create a nice, data, real uh, predictive data analysis course. Okay. So, okay. So we are in the mode of doing exploratory data analysis. So all of you should have this data now. So let's go ahead and see what we can see. Right. So first thing, of course, this is a useful thing. You have all these columns. Now we can ask the question, can we get the age distribution of the parents? Now of the passengers, right? So one thing is, okay, actually this is not the most powerful thing because ages are going to be null. But uh, still, you can ask this. You can just look at, you can sort these values. You can look at the head and tail, right? So you can see the highest and lowest. But notice immediately, I'm going to switch and, okay, there's one more thing here. You can get the maximum of the age and the minimum of the age. Even though there are nulls in that column, this all works, right? But we know later we'll have to come back and fill the nulls. But now I'm going to slowly also start introducing some visualization. Right. But of course I have a full session on visualization. And the reason is it's easy to draw one chart here and there, but then when you want a title and a, you know, label for the axis and so on, it becomes a little tedious. I feel like it becomes a subject unto itself. So today we will do something where we will to, in this session, we'll do something where we'll start using these charts. And in context, I will explain that it's not very complicated to do something like this. If you take a column and you call the function hist on it, then it will automatically show you a histogram, right? So we'll start using it and we'll kind of learn by using, right? And uh, it's kind of cool and pretty as well. But most importantly for this discussion, 
it does give you a reasonable idea of the age distribution, right? And you see that most people are around between 20 and 40. There are a few younger people and older people, right? So a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, okay, so the important thing for us to do now is to ask the question, can we figure out the survival probability of males and females? So can we go ahead and do this? Uh, how about I give you five minutes? Uh, how's, how's everyone doing? Anyone? Okay. So I'm going, I'm going to start typing the answer, but before I do, did anyone manage to do this? or any uh, subset of this. Do you need a couple more minutes? Tell me something in chat. Do you want me to start typing the answer or are you going to, you're still working on it? Someone? <laughs> Stop typing. Okay. Okay. I'll give you one more minute. Okay. By the way, uh, are you okay? So let me write something here. Do, can you see me typing here? I have a couple of windows open, and I'm not sure which one is in focus. Can you see me? Can you see me typing here? I have df uh, dot. Yeah. Do you see me print out the, uh, uh, the male female column? Okay, good. So, okay. So the first thing we want to do is let's see how do we get hold of, um, the males, for example, right? So you, we have this idea, which we talked about It's called Boolean indexing. So if you said the, if you set this value equals male, you can get the subset of males. Okay. So here you, you, so, okay, so let me go step by step and run everything. This is what you should do when you're playing around with this, right? If I say uh, sex equals male, then I will get all of, you know, it'll be true if it matches and false if it does not. So this is a Boolean indexer or Boolean array. I can use this to index my data frame, right? So if I do something like this, this will tell me all the males, right? And so if I, if I, if I, uh, if, if I count the length of this, so let's just do this quickly. If I do length, you can do len, I use len often, but there are many ways to count this, but for now, let's just do it like this. So it tells me there are 577 men and then you can do female here and then you should probably get 340. Okay. There's, so there's some ratio of males to females, but now we want to count. This is going to become our denominator, right? So, um, so we can go ahead and do this, but we still haven't figured out how do we get those who survived, right? So in order to get those who survived, we can filter first by female, and then we can take the column called survived, right? And notice now, I'm going to just tell you something important here. This is something that I don't know whether you actually are going to think it's nice or not nice, but it's a shortcut I'm using today. So notice how when I have a column, instead of typing the column name 
uh, so there are two ways you can do this. You can do it like this, or you can do it by taking df, put a bracket, put a quote, and type the column name like this. These are synonyms. And you can ask the question, why do we have two different ways of doing it? It turns out that the more robust way of doing it is the one on the right hand side. Right? And the reason is that there are certain cases in which this will not work. And here are a few examples. If the name has a space in it, right? If it has a if the name is something like this, then it will not work, right? You cannot put a dot because there are spaces. If the name is the name of a function that pandas has, for example, if you had a column called min or something, then also you would have trouble and so on and so forth. You, this, the right hand side will always work, no matter what it is, but the left hand side will not work if I have a column called min. So this thing is something that I, you know, initially I thought I would never use, but uh, these days when I'm working on data science, I have chosen all my columns carefully. That allows me to do the dot. And so the dot really makes my life easier because I don't have to put the brackets and the quotes. And also you can get some kind of statement completion like this, right? So you can actually go, if you have longish names, you don't have to type too much. Okay, so that's just an aside now. So we'll go back to uh, using, and maybe this is an example for you of how we pick up some new capabilities. As you're doing something, you might think of a shorter way and or you might see a shorter way in some documentation and then you can start using it after testing it out a little bit okay uh, but also it's important to know the pitfalls like this thing doesn't work in some cases etc and i think that may be one place where you can get stuck uh, i think somebody said you should avoid naming with spaces and function names yes this is absolutely true but notice we in, we pull data in from external world and you can find all those diseases out there right people don't follow these careful conventions and one one possibility is that when you pull data sets from the external world you rename everything properly carefully right so with that caveat yes that's how i started working actually initially i had problems when i got data sets from the outside world and then i said you know what the first thing i'm going to do is standardize all the names write them all i used to rename everything like with lowercase and all this stuff we use python conventions for everything uh, again, just so you can absorb why this is serious complications here and notice these complications are all far away from the code. But if you don't master all these complications, there's no question of writing code, right? So let me spend a minute on this naming convention in the database. You have SQL naming conventions and in the code, you have Python naming conventions, SQL naming conventions, table names always start with a capital letter, right? And column names and so on. There are conventions there. So when you read from a table, it's going to come in with this, with this kind of database naming convention possibly, right? And then, so question is how careful, defensive and disciplined are we going to be? Then correspondingly, we can invent patterns around it. The best recommendation would be every time you read from a source, you don't rush away to do your data analysis. You standardize everything in your code. It will take you, you know, an extra half an hour or an extra day if necessary, if it's very complicated but then your life is going to be extremely nice. So, okay, that's a philosophical thing to say. You should make it part of your process. Uh, by the way, some of these thoughts are thoughts of people with experience. So if you start doing some of this, it will be really good in job situations when people ask you things and you say, this is how I approach a data problem. I first analyze the domain, then I organize you know, my load processes. In the load process, I standardize things. If you show some of that kind of thought, thinking and detail orientedness, then you can, you can shine, right? Compared to people who have just copy pasted code or not spent time thinking about it, this could be really helpful. But unfortunately, it's also not a prescription. So you have to create your own, but have fun with it. Anyway, so now let's go on. So we got this. So now I can get this column called survive. Uh, right, so by the way, that statement completion is a little slow, so I I will just type it out, right? And with spellings, of course. Okay. So notice when you become reliant on so statement completion, when it doesn't work, then you're like, okay, what's going on, right? Okay. So let's see what happens. So I got the survived column. Now, does anybody want to suggest quickly, how can I find out who survived? How many survived? Give me a quick suggestion. I got hold of the column. We need one more idea. Some, of course, there you go. So if I do some, then we are done, right? 
So that will tell me how many females survived. So that's 233. And we already computed the total, right? We know how many, how many females are there. So I'll just do that for you just now. So you take this out, take out the survived column. And then if you sum it, right? Oh, no, not sum. Length here. So you take the length. Then you got this. So that's a nice looking number. Okay. Uh, you can get the probabilities. If you don't take the probabilities, then they become rates, right? If you just take this, it's the survival rate. You can say 233 out of, uh, you know, and you can take the complement as well, right? So, so there are small data analysis things here you can do. And you can repeat the same for males. So I think you got it. Um, uh, quickly, if you want it, I'm just uh, showing you here now pandas has uh, pandas has also functions for mean. So let me give you an example. For example, uh, if you ask, and this is not, this is for you to write some code. Okay. So I'm just going to use this cell to write something to show you a capability. For example, if you want to ask what percentage of people survived total, right? Then you can just do DF dot. Uh, let's see. DF dot. Yeah. DF dot survived dot mean right that's a pandas function and it'll give you 38 percent okay and you can try just initially just to orient yourself think about how you would compute this by hand then later you can switch to using all of pandas functions okay so pandas has all the stat functions here just as there's mean there's standard deviation and so on right uh, and then today i will send you the pandas documentation so you can look up all the functions you want uh, so, okay. So small exercises for you to do. I don't have to do all of them. If there's a particular question you want me to look at, then you can tell me. Uh, but before I go further, tell me on chat, are we doing okay? Am I going too fast or too slow or just right? I'm relying on you to steer me. Okay. Because some of this is tedious. Uh, just right. Okay. Thank you. That's very kind. Okay. So now let's go do next thing. Okay. So this is all done by hand. But now let's see, I'll show you three powerful ways, three powerful ways to analyze the same data, right? So we can take this data. I already told you group by earlier. So let's use group by and see what we can do here. So you take group by, right? You take group by and we're going to group by, uh, group by is kind of powerful. Okay. So for example, I'm going to group by the sex and the survived column. Right. I'm going to group by two columns first by sex and then by survived. And then I'm just going to count. Okay. How many are there in each of these categories? Uh, if I run this, it'll give me a, it'll give me a series. Okay. With a lot of, uh, it'll give me a data frame actually because the multiple columns, all of the columns have the same values. So you could pick any column. So right now, let me just pick passenger ID. Okay, so that will give me now a series, but I would like to have a data frame. So actually there's a helpful function. It's called two frame. So this is an example of something I didn't know until recently. So I would actually create data frames by hand, but now you can just use two frame. And now look, it's starting to look pretty already, right? It's looking pretty, except it has this passenger ID from where this data came from. And really this should say count. So something like this. So why not? We can also just let's store this in a new data frame. Let's call it rest for result. And then we'll say rest dot columns. So I can assign the columns of this data frame I'm creating rest dot columns is counts. Okay. And then let's just look at res and see what we got. Look, that's, I'm going to take a deep breath and say, wow, that's pretty, isn't it? In a couple of lines, we were able to group this data set split it by a couple of categories. Notice that that all is general. It's not specific to this code, right? You could have taken any data set, grouped it by a subset of columns. There's no reason it has to be one or two columns. And then I'm able to tabulate it very quickly, right? And uh, if you do a lot of this kind of work, then this is very, very handy, right? Um, so yeah, this might be an essential ingredient somewhere quickly, right? When you get a new data set, this may be one of the few things you do quickly. At least you count some rates, right? You do some counts, you count survival rate or 
success rate or failure rate or whatever. You can count a few things by, by this method. Because it is so central, there are a couple of other ways to do it. So pandas has a very cool function. I don't, I I'm not an expert on this function, but because I think the uh, statisticians use it a lot and I'm not a statistician, but um, there's this function called cross tab. I could ask quickly, have any of you used cross tab before in some other context or in pandas context? Anyone? It's hard to get an answer to that question, right? All those who have no's will say, will not say anything. So, okay. So let me go ahead. If there is, I would love to know. Okay. So let's do it. So cross tab takes the columns I want to cross tabulate. So I will take uh, sex comma survived. Okay. So we got these two columns and you can just run it. Let's see what happens. Okay. So it looks like this. But actually, you can do even more cool things. For example, you could set uh, some colors to this table, right? So let me see. You can do something like this. Oops. Uh, you can say dot style, dot background. It would be so nice if my statement completion worked. Background gradient, I think it's called background gradient and here you can choose a color map. I'm just showing you that. Okay. Maybe pretty is good, right? So there's a color map called summer underscore R I think. And if I type this all correctly, wow, look at that. Now it's even colored. Okay. I don't know. I don't know if it's worth the extra typing, but if you're making it in a report, so let me just mention this because we have our projects in the background. If you do all these nice things in a notebook, you can just export to PDF or whatever, or share your notebook, which is what you're going to do. Then I can be impressed by all the beautiful visualization you've done. Okay. But anyway, you can decide whether you like it or you don't like it. I would definitely ins insert this comment here that taking attention to make sure that your presentation and your outputs, your press, well, first of all, your ideas have to be good, clear. But then I think beautiful visualization, right? And we're going to do a few more visualizations. A beautiful visualization is a wonderful thing, right? And so probably, yes, you should, you should practice and master it. Even if it's not something, some, some people don't enjoy it so much doing all these pretty things, but I think it's worth just taking it as a skill and just mastering. Okay. So now the last one, which we said is pivot table. So you said df dot pivot underscore table. Okay. So this is a pivot table and here you say that in, you can choose an index. For example, you say the index uh, is sex and then you have columns. So the columns would be in this case, this is probably interesting to those who have been using Excel, but these pivot tables can be more, uh, can be more powerful. Then you have to specify what kind of function you want to use to aggregate. So here you can say you, so you can do all kinds of cool things here with aggregation function. But the aggregation function here is just, I don't know, is just, uh, let's say survived, uh, the length of it, right? So you want to apply this function to the survive column. Uh, and then we are almost done. Right. Uh, you can put a fill value. Let's see what we get here. Oops. Oh, this is curly brace. This is a, this is a dictionary. Okay. So I have to specify a fill value here. So. And then just look at my code again. Let me just see what I did here. It's hard to debug when I'm live. Ah, oh, okay. 
Okay, so we managed to get it. So let's just look at it again one more time. So index was one column. The columns was the other one. The aggregation function was the length, which gives us, you know, and then set a fill value if necessary, and then we're good, right? But anyway, long, long detour here, uh, just essentially trying to do the same thing using three different tools. But now that I've kind of typed my way through three different tools, I would say to all of you, definitely try to master your favorite way of doing this type of analysis. I think that group by should be your go-to uh, at this point, but I think pivot table is a closed second and then cross tab is a specialized thing. So if you need it, then pick that up as well. Okay. Uh, so now let me just switch over. So this was all kind of crunching numbers, right? And even though you see a table like this, it's hard for you to see what happened. So let's just, let me just show you how easy it is in this case to do a little visualization. So there's this library called Seaborn. I use it because it makes pretty images. It's a little lighter than matplotlib. It is actually essentially a wrapper around matplotlib, which is the main visualization tool. We will cover this all in detail in a separate session. But since it is so easy, why not we start using it, right? So if you take Seaborn, it has a method called count plot. And in count plot, I basically say count my data frame, which I specified in this parameter called data, which is I pass the data frame, and then say count it by sex, right? And by specifying this hue parameter, it basically does an additional, so it does separate the data by sex and then groups further by survived, which is exactly what we did grouping by these two columns, and then makes a very pretty graph. And if we get this pretty graph, what is the story we can tell right away from looking at the graph? We can see that the males didn't do so well, right? They had a much lesser chance of survival and the females did better, right? And uh, there's all kinds of explanations for it. But at this point, we're just playing with the data and analyzing it and so on. Um, and we will spend a lot more time in visualization. But I do think that this little picture here uh, and you should just go away and reflect on it. These tables tell a story. It takes us a little longer to understand what it's telling us. But when you make a picture, it, it right away, it's easy for us to see. Model of this story is that when you make your reports, you should include some kind of visualization, okay? Um, your visualization will become more comprehensive after our session on visualization. Uh, but, uh, okay, but here we are. So, okay, so next one is filling missing age values, right? So if you, first you have to detect it, okay? So to detect if there are missing values, there's a function called isNA, and it will return booleans again, and you can just count, right? And so on. So if you count here, you can figure out how many values are missing. Now, uh, so let me just say, so now I will leave it, I meant to go through this in detail but uh, maybe I will, maybe I won't uh, go through. You should think about what is the proxies you can use for age values, right? So you can take just the overall mean or median and assign it to those that are blank. This is the first example. You can also set the age to zero, but that would kind of skew your data distribution a lot. So one strategy could be assign the mean of the ages to the blanks. But we could get more sophisticated and say, no, no, if you're a male, I'll assign the mean of the male values and so on, right? So do you want to see quickly? Okay, I'll ask it as a question. Do you want to see like how, how, how you could either compute that or assign it? Anyone? Otherwise, I'll go to the next. Why are you guys all working on it? I keep prompting all of you to go to chat. Okay, maybe this is a moment. I have to take a minute and say this to all of you. It is, uh, for me, uh, I, somebody wants to see my solution. Okay, so I want to say something to all of you that is really, really important. I don't know if a few words from me is going to have that much impact, but I cannot resist saying this. Uh, the one of the most important skills that I can teach all of you, or at least suggest to all of you, is you must be an advocate for yourself. That right? which means interacting, asking questions, 
extracting what you need to be successful from the environment. I don't know if the systems you have grown up in encourage you to do all this, but you have to be insistent, right? It's not just enough to go in a quiet corner and work hard. Uh, we must use and uh, urge everyone around us to give us what we need to be successful, right? And in this case, I'm here to help all of you. So please, uh, I'm waiting for chat or email, uh, either suggestions or questions uh, so that I can, you know, adjust what I'm saying to meet your needs. Okay, so please at least use this course, the rest of this course as a way to practice that. Okay, uh, I'm here to respond. So then you should say, okay, Vijay, I need more of this or I want to see a solution or I don't want to see a solution. That would be already a step in the right direction. Okay, okay. So since somebody said I will, and don't let one person who is chatty take up the whole class, right? I mean, if you if you defer, then you should speak up, and then we'll find out how to uh, how to choose a course of action if half of you want to see it and half don't. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so let's engage. So uh, the first thing here is okay. So how would I find the mean? For example, if I decided to assign uh, the mean, right? Then uh, I have to say DF. So let's say, for example, I decide to do it by sex, right? I'm going to assign a mean by sex. So I will say group by and uh, oops. Um, then I'll take the age column out and then we can call mean on it. Right. And it'll give me the means. But uh, while I'm here, okay, median is also available. It is really important for you to think, does anyone want to say why we should use a mean or median? Probably that's too much. I'm pushing it now. So, okay, I'm just going to keep typing. But okay, so you can choose your favorite measure of central tendency, right? And then you can just assign this value to those that are NA, right? Uh, so now that's a non-trivial query. So let me just show you this. So this, uh, you can do it in different ways. For example, you can filter the NAs and then assign values and so on. There's a very powerful way of doing it. I hope this is, this would be my, my way of doing it, but, uh, I don't know if this is helping you or hurting you because it is sophisticated and then, but anyway, at least to show you what is possible, I will type it. Okay. So you, you do DF dot, group by df dot group by and you pick how we want to group by then now i have to pick the column that i would like to change which is the age and then here i have this cool function it's called transform okay before i type anything more i want to tell all of you please don't look at this code and say oh my god that's impossible for me to understand that was not my intention um it just is my only intention is to say there are kind of more and more complex ways to more modify your data. Uh, but you, I don't think that if you don't use transform, you are not accomplished your goal of learning to use pandas. You just have to come back and think about how would you do this in your own way in another way, etc. Right. Um, okay. So, so transform basically allows you to transform a column subsequent to group grouping, right? So for example, you can say transform and here, I don't know how many of you know Lambda functions, but you can pass in a Lambda function, right? And the Lambda function can be used to fill the NA values. So for example, fill NA, you can see why this is completely non-trivial. Okay. Uh, even if this runs, let me ask a quick question on chat. Does this look like very sensible and cool or does it look like gibberish? I would be quite pleased if somebody said it looks like gibberish because it should, right? I mean, it's very, uh, this is the kind of code that I might write to show off and I'm apologizing for writing it. That's why I'm asking this question. So anyway, but let me, let me get your input. Does it look, does it look cool and easy or does it look like gibberish? Someone. Still very quiet. I thought after my speech on interacting and advocate, okay, little messy. <laughs> okay, good. So, okay, uh, but uh, like I said, my purpose for doing this was only to show you that complicated uh, code can be written fairly easily. But what I want you to think about now 
uh, even after this class, if you sit down for a minute, is that I want to modify the age column. And basically I'm saying that for the males, I want to assign the median age of the males, right? Which we have computed here. And for the females, I want to assign the median age of the females. That's it. That's the concept. That's the million dollar thing that's worth learning, right? Or what do I want to do articulated precisely? Then you can sit down and find five different ways of doing it. And eventually you'll pick your favorite. Okay, so if you end up on this one as your favorite way of doing this, wonderful. I'm happy. Otherwise, forget about this one. Do it your own way. Okay. Uh, okay, so just... Um, so now what can we do? So now let me just pause here and say, okay, what are we trying to do here? And the answer is, well, we could start to predict survival by just looking at the data already, which is kind of cool. And which is what the whole excitement about data analysis is, isn't it? We started with the data set. We had no idea what was in it. Now we know that it's the Titanic passengers. We know that some people died, some people survived. And now we start to say, well, I could probably tell you who is likely to survive. And we can get more and more sophisticated, right? So for example, here, just by knowing one piece of information, whether you're male or female, I could already come up with a survival probability, right? But now we can get more and more complicated, right? So for example, you can use not only male and female, but you can use passenger class, right? So passenger class, we said it's a proxy for social status. So we can use that now and just, you know, without changing too much, this is the excitement of pandas, right? When we get, just to add another extra group by criteria, I don't have to really work hard. I mean, mentally, I have to think of this idea that passenger class would be a good thing to put in here, but writing the code is easy, right? And then from here, from these counts, you can look, you can plot it, you can see if you see a pattern here, and then you can write a paper that says, yeah, these are the three best, or this is a nice way to predict. I can pr predict with some confidence and the prediction and measuring the confidence levels, et cetera, will come in our next session on data analysis, right? But I wanted to show you how already just by massaging the data a little bit, we start to get into the meat of data science, right? That we can analyze the data and we can gain some predictive power, right? Um, okay, so I will just leave this as a suggestion for you. Um, it's very interesting that there is, you know, actually there is a title column in our data set, right? So let's see, df dot head. Head will show us this thing. Uh, no, actually there is, okay, so let me see. There is no title column in our data set, but you can see that in the names there's a title, right? There's Mr. here and Mrs. here and miss here and so on. And because our age column is so broken, you might think that, oh, actually there is information here. The, you know, some of, you know, there can be master, there can be sir, there's information in the titles. So if we actually extract these things from the string, we could create a new column called title. Now that becomes the core of data analysis to do all these kind of things but depending on whether you understand regular expressions or not. So I didn't want to do it in the class. I don't want to overwhelm you, right? With all kinds of difficult things to do, but I definitely want to suggest to you that there are possibilities, right? And so somebody would say, okay, let's take this, extract all the titles out and then see if the title becomes an interesting way to group my data by. And will I get, for example, I can get a better proxy. Okay, so just ignore this part for now. I, I'm starting to feel it's heavy for me already, so it must be heavy for you. I just wanted to show you that there are all kinds of tedious code on the internet. We, when we start writing code like this, which is repetitive and tedious, we should pause and say there should be better ways of doing it at least. Okay, but this is a small sub exercise. Any of you who want to tackle this, Try it and then we can exchange some notes on email if you want. Okay, but I don't make it a pivotal point of our discussion. Okay. Um, okay, so we are doing well. We have a few minutes left. I think I will, I can continue or I can pause here. You'll have to tell me on chat. We can talk for a few minutes on a new concept here. And then I will tell you quickly about your projects and, uh, uh, and then we can be done. So, but... We, we covered most of what I wanted to share with you today, which is 
how to take the a, a new data set like the Titanic data set. Okay, uh, just to recap again, for you, for your projects and for your analysis, you can go to the internet. There are many ways of accessing data, but there's almost always a way to download a CSV file. If any of you are interested in other ways of accessing data, send me an email. We can, we can see if I can squeeze it into the course or not. Most likely not, but at least interest will be clear to me. Just get your CSV file, plug it in, and off you go, right? A nice report should come out after some thought and hard work. Uh, that's what I wanted to share with you today, right? And I use pandas along the way to do all of the analysis. So uh, I have one more concept, but how are you feeling? Are you ready to take one more concept or you kind of, we should wind down? Someone, <laughs> one more, okay. Okay, for those who are like, okay, we should wind down. Okay, I'll keep it short and brief, okay? But there is this concept which we touched on which is the concept of hierarchical indexes, right? And for now, I will just show you a hierarchical index here, which I have just created, right? Um, so here you see, I have asked it to create an index on two sets of values, right? And that will give us a hierarchical index. And so let's just run this and look at it. And you see that there's a double, double index here. There's an index which is on the rows, which is, all of these first three rows have the index A in this column and the integer index one, two, three, one, two, right? So it's a hierarchical index. Now, immediately, if you go and ask pandas, can you please show me the index? Then it returns these two, two you know, it, it returns this information for us, right? And you can see this uh, hierarchical structure. Now here it's very dummy example but you have to start thinking about places in life where you might need a hierarchical index. And I'm currently working with some data sets that naturally have hierarchical indexes. Usually, I think you would start to see it if you had one of the indexes to be time and the other index to be a property or one of the indexes to be an identifier, right? And the other index to be a property, something like this, right? So then you could easily end up with multiple indexes and, uh, but, Everything will work just like you will with regular index. So you can take a slice out of the data set, for example, like this, right? Um, one thing I wanted to say is, yes, this is a good example. If you do group buys, then group buys will actually give you, um, so here's an example, right? If you, if you create this data set, level one, level two here as an example, if you create this data set, let's see. Now, if I group by level one, level two, so this is a better example, I think. If I group by level one, level two, and then I do a count on the column A. Okay, this is just a metaphor, right? It's just saying I'm grouping on two columns and I'm counting on a third column. Then look at the structure of what comes out naturally and it is hierarchical, right? Because it's grouped first by level one and then by level two. So I guess, even if it didn't start with a hierarchical index, in our world, we could end up with hierarchical indices, right? And it is unfortunately a mildly specialized topic. So I would just say to you right now, you could defer hierarchical indices for now, for a few days at least, then come back to it in a concentrated burst when you need it. Accumulate reasons to use it. I went for a long period without using it, so accumulate reasons to use it and then just take some time and master it, okay? Okay, I, I, I want to talk about stacking and unstacking, but uh, I will not do it today, okay? Because I think there's lots of concepts. I don't think it's fair that I uh, tax you to absorb one more concept. I will tack this on either in the next session or into our visualization discussion, okay? Uh, Okay, I'm going to switch quickly and talk about projects and labs. I think all of you have the dates and deadlines, uh, so you know what you're working against. But if you go to the course section, I just want to just take you to the place uh, where the, so there's one more lab, I have not posted it. Probably this weekend or next week, I will post one more lab. Probably a little bit of data analysis in there, okay? So actually, maybe even after the next class, you will be in a position to take the last lab. Um, Quickly, what did, did, did any of you find the labs instructive? Someone on chat, quickly, while I'm finding my way to this. Did you learn anything while doing the labs? Or you learned everything before the labs? 
it's hard to get you. Well, I somebody has to send me an email and tell me. Okay, somebody says it's helpful. Send me an email and tell me why it's so hard to get you to chat. Okay, um, or text as you might call it. Uh, but okay, let me just. I'm on the page I wanted, right? Uh, thanks uh, to Hayden for saying the labs are helpful. Um, so okay, so let's go on here. So if you go here, you can see this um, project is here. Just go ahead and select it. So I really have opened the door here, right? I've not given you any guidelines of what project you should pick or whatever. Uh, just go ahead and think about some data set and then try to fill in your responses into these boxes, right? The most important thing though is that once you are clear what you're going to do, you should download your data and you should create, you know, you should create your own uh, your own notebook that analyzes the data. Do everything in the cloud like I have done. And when you're finished, just paste in, right? When you make a, a just paste in the, um, just paste in the link to your uh, repository, right? On In the cloud. Then I will clone it and I can read it and analyze it and so on. Uh, any questions on the project? Otherwise we are, we are, we are done for today. Hopefully you had fun. And then I'll see you all next week. If you need any help, send me emails. Some of you have already done it. Uh, I will do my best to be responsive. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Keep make sure you take time to practice. Okay. <laughs>